Um, so Haka says uh, he presented last year on uh, how to uh, build a Tesla coil the way Tesla did. I believe that's the, the title of it. And it was uh, quite refined from a lot of the generic, you know, how to build a Tesla coil stuff you'll, you'll find online. And uh, uh, he's an experienced builder, experimenter in the fringe sciences with a diver diverse uh, range of interests. Uh, he draws inspiration from MacGyver and Robert Heinlein, uh, embracing a multidisciplinary approach. Haka says his uh, recent work explore, uh, explores uh, Tesla coils and other high voltage phenomena, uh, which is inspired by Eric Dollard and other researchers. And he's currently working in the area of parametric variation, which this falls right into that category. And the presentation is called Sling Maxwell's Demons, which Haka says will tell you all about it. Help us welcome uh, Haka says. And one of the uh, electrical minded YouTubers was building his own Tesla coil, which uh, if you see on the screen, he's running at 20 volts at one amp. So he's running at about 20, 20 watts. And you'll see he barely gets a uh, fluorescent tube lit from about four inches away. Uh, what we presented last year was just using a frequency generator, no upgrade or power or anything like that. And we were lighting a full fluorescent tube from a couple few feet away. So it gives you an idea we weren't talking about the same type of coils that are called Tesla coils today. Uh, glad to say we're still making progress uh, through successes and failed experiments. We continue to learn a lot along the way. Uh, it's, a, it's a path and not a quick solution. Uh, we, learn, we often learn more from our failures than from our successes. There was another paradigm that began to arise in the 18th and 19th centuries. This model was observationally identical to the standard model but it operated on a completely different underlying premise. Instead of subatomic particles leading to electrical and magnetic fields and forces, electricity and magnetism were considered the primary forces, the fundamental forces. These primary magnetic and magnetodielectric currents would form complex vortices and twists and knots, like a, a rushing river or a complex stream or tornado. As a result, these complex twists and turns would form these little packets of electromagnetic energy that could exist in free space that we would call particles today. In this paradigm, reality is formed by interacting waves of electric and magnetic fields and forces. So both of these paradigms can lead to good predictions, as you can see from the other model. But this model is nice because it has the advantage of being inherently compatible with quantum mechanics since all of reality can be broken up into wave functions that are small vortices or whirlpools, whirlpools in the ether, in the fabric of space. Uh, I thought I'd mention a couple quick uh, experimenters that I find credible because telling the truth or seeking the truth versus telling a story. One of them uh, here is uh, Eric Dollard. If you'll notice, a lot of his work is published online. There's hours of lectures with ex incredibly articulate language. A lot of it comes from the 20th and 19th century, so it might be hard to translate to modern electrical engineering, but nevertheless, it's real. He'll show principles of operation. He'll show data. He'll show how to wind the mater what materials are required. He'll show relatively simple formulas and relationships that you could use. So this is why he's one of the colleagues that I work with, because it's a credible researcher. Likewise, Griffin Brock, who I think is also here, uh, a lot of the stuff that he does is step by step. He uh, works with a lot of glass blowing and a lot of uh, Tesla related experiments. But you'll notice that he takes very detailed measurements. He takes very, uh, he's not keeping any secrets. He'll show everything that he can. Uh, he'll show operating theories if, if, and admit that they might be wrong or wrong in some places. A third of the colleagues, uh, Adrian Marsh, who spoke this morning. Uh, if you go onto his website, you'll notice there are thousands of pages of intricately kept documentation and notes about every one of the setups that he makes. It's set up that anybody that's following his work, as long as they knew something about electrical engineering, could follow from A to Z and replicate anything that he's doing. It's so Maxwell's demon, which I'm not sure how many people are aware of, is a thought experiment that would hypothetically violate the second law of thermodynamics. This was proposed by physicist James Clerk Maxwell, who I talked about earlier. In this thought experiment, a demon controls a small massless door between two chambers of gas. An individual gas molecule, or, or atoms, would approach the door, 
the demon could quickly open or close it to allow only certain fast-moving molecules in one direction, and slow-moving molecules are allowed to pass in the other direction. Because of the kinetic energy and gas laws are dependent on the velocity of the molecules, this can cause one side of the chamber to heat up and one side to cool down. Since the opening closing the door requires a certain different amount of energy and is not related to the energy traveling, this would violate the second law of thermodynamics. Notice that in this system, there's already energy present. There's already molecules and atoms moving around in ambient air. This is normal everyday atmospheric pressure. And in our current scientific consens consensus, we actually have about four, four or more free energies with quotes at our disposal. That is to say, energy that exists a perpetual force that is not exhausted over time. We have the electrostatic force, which can provide an inexhaustible attractive or repulsive force against two charged objects. We have the magnetic force that could provide an inexhaustible attractive or repulsive force between two objects. If you take a magnet and stick it to the fridge, it's going to be stuck till the end of time or until something rusts out thousands of years later. There's nothing, the force is going to persistently try to keep the magnet stuck against the fridge. X number of pounds of force will happen forever. With Maxwell's demon, we have a way to take energy that's already present, and we can shuffle it around. But can we do this with the other free energies, the electrostatic or the magnetic force? What would happen if the magnet in, in this picture were to suddenly disappear? or if the paper clips in the picture were suddenly lose their magnetic properties. The magnetic force is still present, but it sort of disappears because it's not having the same impact on the object. And there's a quick video on here, which we'll see if we got the right audio on this. And if I found a new toy, a science toy too, showing a bit of physics that I knew about, but never seen demonstrated. It's a Curie effect magnetic heat engine. And here's the magnet, this large silver thing at the back, a very strong needle yes. magnet. Here, curiously enough, is a piece of aluminium wire on a brass string, but it's got a little bit of nickel, which is ferromagnetic at the base, which is why it's being attracted to this piece. But what's the candle doing there? It's quite a small kit, but it's going to do something rather extraordinary, I'm hoping. So I'll pull that away, tilt it, light the candle. And the thing is going to flip forward. Do some adjustment because you want to get that piece of. Yes. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Chaotic motion. What on earth is happening here? Well, the Curie point is the point at which a metal will lose its magnetism. So when this is coming into the back a bit, into the magnetic field, it's pulled towards it. But it, once it comes out over the flame. It heats it above 200 degrees and loses its magnetic property. The magnet has no, 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 no effect on it. So parametric variation. If we ask these questions, we can see immediately where unique solutions start to come into play. And this is where uh, Lone Pine writings actually goes into this indirectly. How much energy does it take to charge a 2 farad capacitor to 1 volt? It takes 1 joule of energy. How much energy is required to charge a 2 Henry inductor to 1 amp? one joule of energy. How much energy does it take to apply one newton of force over one meter? This is conventional uh, force laws, one joule of energy. How much energy does it take to raise one gram of water by one degree centigrade? One joule of energy, standard thermodynamics. But how much energy is required to change the capacitance of a capacitor from 1,000 picofarads to 100 picofarads? That is unknown or it's indetermined because the energy required to change capacitance is not directly related to the energy that's in the system. So if I have a capacitor, oh, I don't. Oh, here we go. Variable capacitor, the energy that it takes to change the capacitance to move this in and out of series is not necessarily related to the charge that's on the plates. Likewise, in a magnetic system, how much energy would it take to change the inductance of a coil from 100 millihenries to 10 millihenries? is unknown or indetermined for the same reason. Changing the parameters of electrostatic or magnetism is not necessarily related to the energy that's getting supplied by it. This is parametric variation. Uh, you'll see there's the Carson motor has three lobes or three, uh, let me say, three poles on it. 
So every rotation of the motor would produce three full cycles. So it gives them the opportunity to leverage higher and higher frequencies, and higher frequencies means higher power. So theoretically, the more you could put in there, the, the higher the frequency and the higher power outputs, but the, you start to lose, it, lose that advantage to other reasons. But, uh, so that's when the capacitor value is high because the plates are overlapping. And then this one, the capacitor value is low because the plates are separated. Uh, he was nice enough to jot down the uh, change in capacitance uh, per each of the sections, and we actually, I did confirm that with the RLC meter. And uh, I did come up with a very rough theoretical formula to estimate the, the potential performance from such a system. So for the Carson motor, it was a change in capacitance times the voltage squared times the number of cycles per second, and then times two because it's two half cycles, and then times 0.7 because it's RMS versus peak power. Since Carson was the only person to attempt it in the last 50 years, uh, I thought I would uh, build a design as well. Uh, but I wanted to use the vacuum component because, as you see, everything starts to go parabolic once you start getting into a good vacuum. <coughs> uh, the stuff was done several months ago. Uh, started with a rough CAD model to generally get an idea how everything was supposed to fit together to get the components and everything. Uh, any machinist or any engineer that started working on this knows there's a lot of, uh, <coughs> a lot of back of envelope and a lot of letting something simmer in the back of your head while you put it together in the background. Uh, the lower motor, or the, the motor on the left here, is the 4-inch uh, version. Uh, this is actually salvaged from a failed version. Uh, technically, this is like the third or fourth iteration, because every time <coughs> I've tried to replicate it in the past, but due to you know, mechanics or isolation or blade separation, it just kind of failed. So uh, the motor on, the, on my right, your left, is a <coughs> sort of a salvaged version of that that actually does work under a vacuum. Uh, the rotor and stator blades were water jet cut. It's a relatively simple design. I just banged something together that I could get out in a, in a hurry. Uh, anybody could do something like that, either themselves or, or batch it out. But that's an idea of how that's put together. Uh, I need a lathe, which you need a lot of spacer components because each of the blades and uh, pieces on here have to be at a relatively uh, static distance because if it shifts too far to one side, the uh, rotor smashes into the stator and you get the a nice little boom. Here's a close-up of uh, some of the construction. <coughs> uh, same thing, the spacers in place, and a lot of it was disassembled and reassembled and little tweaks and advancements on the way to get it finished. I uh, needed the mill, machining the bearing blocks and things like that. Until finally, yeah, we know that. We can see it right here. But uh, you can see it was quite the, the ordeal and a lot of machining operations. Uh, but one of the reasons I decided to build a, a mechanical system like this is because uh, not everybody is an electrical engineer or electrical experimenter. And uh, this gives the mechanical engineer or the machinist uh, something that they can actually build because it's as simple as it gets. Uh, that'll be the stuff that we're continuing to work on there. But there's a motor right there. If anyone wants to take a look or pictures or anything like that, it does work. You need a high voltage DC power supply and source, but yeah, that's the idea. And I encourage anybody, uh, I have all the information, I want to see other people doing this too, because I guess I'm the first person to do this in 50 years, so who wants to be the second? <laughs>